So when you guys are considering who's your one and thinking about you know, inviting them to church, one of the things that you can say to them that's pretty non-threatening kind of thing is you turn to them and say, you got to come hear our choir and hear the music at our church. Simple little thing. Bring them on in. That wasn't bad, was it? Choir looked good, sounded good, man, alive. Y'all remember tonight too, 6 p.m., we're having a uh, ordination service tonight for Wright Barksdale and for Daniel Wright. Wright's going to be a deacon. Daniel's going to be an ordained minister of the gospel. As part of the service, Daniel and Wright will be leading us in the Lord's Supper tonight. So I invite you to come back, encourage you to come back. When it's over, we'll gather in the fellowship hall for a for a uh, reception for the two of them. And this is a big deal. I do not remember, uh, maybe some of you do, but I don't remember the last time we've ordained somebody to the gospel ministry here at First Baptist. And it's a cool thing that God is reaching among our number and lifting up people to go out and spread the gospel. That's a good thing that the church gave birth to that. So that's cool. Y'all be here tonight. The only football game on today is the Pro Bowl. It's the guys that, that, that the only ones, they're not afraid of getting hurt because they probably aren't going to play in a playoff game or in the Super Bowl. It's not worth watching. Come on to church, 6 o'clock. We'll be here. All right, Philippians. You know where we are, Philippians chapter 1. Y'all go ahead and look while you're doing it. I'll catch you up right quick on where we are. When we started studying Philippians a few weeks ago, the Apostle Paul wrote this letter to the folks at the church at Philippi. They were very special to him. Because he got the church started, he went there, met Lydia, went down to the riverbank. Well, he met Lydia at the riverbank, preached Jesus to her there. The Bible says that God opened her heart to understand what he was saying. She realized that she was a sinner under the wrath of God, needed a savior, needed somebody to rescue her. Paul told her about our rescuer, Jesus she understood, she becomes saved. She went home, told her family they were saved. Soon they had a little church going there at Philippi. Paul went some other places. The little church grew. They heard that Paul was in prison in Rome, so they sent him a gift by a guy by the name of Epaphroditus. That doesn't matter. I just like saying the word Epaphroditus. It's just one of those little cool mellifluous, never mind. Uh, so Epaphroditus took him the gift. And he's going to write them a thank you note. And it's the book of Philippians is what he's writing to them. We said that the reason that Paul and the Philippians were so close was because they had a common mission. They were, they were of one essence. They all knew that the gospel of Jesus Christ was the liberating message of all time. That Jesus Christ is the one that frees us from our sin. He gives us a new future. He gives us a new past. He is the one that comes into us, makes us new, forgives us of our sin, makes us right with God. They both knew this. They wanted everybody to know it, and they were one in that fellowship. Now, last week, we looked at the prayer that Paul prayed for them. And in that prayer, what he prayed is that their love, that word agape, their love, would be so knowledgeable, so smart, and so discerning that they would always be able to tell what was real and what was counterfeit when it came to life, when it came to the things of God, that they'd always be able to recognize what was godly, they'd always be able to recognize what was counterfeit so that they would always choose God's thing. And he assured them in that prayer that even though sometimes it doesn't feel like it, you are always filled with the fruit of his righteousness. You can never be separated from Christ. You are one in Christ. Once you are his child, you will always be his child. You may not feel like it. You may feel like you failed, that you're a bum, that whatever. Your feelings don't count. The fact of the matter is that you are filled with the righteousness of Christ to the glory of God the Father. It is to God's glory that you were saved. So it's a cool thing. And that's where he's got them to. And then we get to verse number 12. And we read 12 through 18. So says, now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me, he's in prison now, has actually advanced the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to everyone else that my imprisonment is because I am in Christ. Most of the brothers have gained confidence in the Lord from my imprisonment and dare even to speak the word, uh, to speak the word fearlessly. 
To be sure, some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. These preach out of love, knowing that I'm appointed for the defense of the gospel. The others proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely thinking that they will cause me trouble in my imprisonment. But what in the world does that matter? Only that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. Now, why did Paul pray the prayer that we read earlier? Paul knows that life never works out like we imagine. He knows that we never end up where we think we're going to end up. And sometimes we start thinking that that we aren't on God's plan, that we're not on God's path, that life is arbitrary and capricious and things just happen to us and we forget the fact that God is in control and when God is in control, we always have a reason to be glad. Now that sounds sort of simple and sort of Pollyanna-ish maybe, but let's dig into that and see what the evidence says. Paul's in prison. He did not plan to go to prison. Paul had a plan. Y'all know we talked about this. He was going to go to the east, and he couldn't go to the east. He was going to go to Bithynia in the north. He couldn't go to Bithynia. He ends up going into Macedonia. He writes a letter to the people in Rome, and he says, when I pass through Rome on my way to Spain, I'll drop in, see you guys, say, hey, how's your mom and them? We'll talk, eat a little bit, and teach, and then I'm going to move on, and I'm going to go to Spain one of these days. And we find out that he never went to Spain. He never made it. That never happened. And in the meantime, I have a friend that says, and in the meantime, it was a mean time. Paul did some things that scare me to death. He was shipwrecked, and for a night, he floated in the ocean. Now, y'all, use your mind. Don't just sit there like stones. I want your heads to engage and think about this and get into the story. He floated in the ocean overnight in the dark. And he wasn't the top of the food chain. Y'all think about that. Would that not be the most terrifying thing in the world? That you are floating in the middle of the ocean, nothing around you, totally dark, and there are things underneath you that have big teeth, and you look like a pork chop. I'm telling you right now, that's frightening. And then when he does get on shore, they start a fire, and he reaches in for some firewood, and a poisonous snake bites his hand. Y'all know how much I enjoy snakes, right? This is the worst thing that could happen, getting bit by a snake. So now he's floated in the ocean, he's been bit by a snake, he gets beaten a bunch of times. That doesn't sound exactly like he wanted his life to go, you know? And then he's in prison. He's got every reason in the world to get into a funk. He's got every reason in the world, got every reason in the world to be in despair. He thought he was going to be the first Billy Graham. He's going to be out all over the place preaching and teaching. And as as good of a Pharisee as he was before, he was going to be an even better preacher. And he was going to go to everywhere and tell everybody about Jesus. And there'd be people all over the place that he'd be preaching to. He has a life-changing message that he can deliver. And he's going to deliver to as many people that will hear it. And the world's going to be changed. And he's in prison. That's not the way he planned this thing to go. But instead of despair and instead of grumbling in verse 18, he says he's rejoicing. He's glad that things are working out like this. How do you do that? How do you do that? How do you do that? You've been in those situations. I've been in those situations. We are a grumbling people. I don't care what the situation is. We'll find something to grumble about. You're on the greatest vacation you've ever been. All your life, you've saved up your money. This is the vacation. It's the best place you could ever go in the world. And everybody's happy. And you go to a restaurant, and they get one thing wrong. And what do you talk about? You don't talk about what a wonderful day it was. You don't talk about the rides. You don't talk about the people you were with. You don't talk about the sun and the excitement. You talk about, my waitress brought me sweet tea, and I ordered unsweetened. You know you do. I know I do. We grumble. We are a grumbling people. We go to work. We grumble about work. We go to church. We grumble about church. We go home. We grumble about home. How do we not be grumbling people? How does Paul not grumble? How in the world is that possible? What does Paul see here that is real? 
You remember we talked about his prayer. He said that, you're, that you would be smart enough, that your discernment would be good enough, that you could separate what is real from what is counterfeit when it comes to God. What does he see that's real? He understands that being in prison is really a good thing and it's not a bad thing. Everyone that knows him knows he's in prison for preaching Jesus and him crucified, but instead of seeing Paul shut down, what they see is Paul getting even stronger. He has a different audience this time. The whole imperial guard, this is like President Trump's secret service. It's the people that are around the big dog. This is Caesar's guys up there, the imperial guard. Chances are if he'd gone and been a little preacher in Rome, he'd have never got to speak to those people. But now here he is, he has an audience with the imperial guard and it says that all of the imperial guard heard it and you know what I bet he was thinking to himself? I bet he was thinking to himself that when they're off in a corner, they're talking about what I'm talking about and I bet you Caesar overhears them talking about Jesus. He's going, you know what, this ain't so bad. But not only says the imperial guard, he says Everyone else knows it too. Everybody that gets near Paul, everybody that comes into his room, everybody that brings him his food, brings him his drink. When he goes to the bathroom, do you understand? Think about this. Let your mind wander just a little bit in this story. Paul's in prison. He can't go to the little boy's room without raising his hand and saying, I got to go. Will you take me to the bathroom? I'm telling you, prison's not such a cool place to be. And yet Paul's going, you know, this isn't so bad. He sees what's real. What would be counterfeit if he was in the midst of all of this bondage and it stopped him cold. That since he didn't go where he thought he was going to go, I must be a failure. Have you ever said that? You get to a certain place in your career, you get into a certain place in your marriage, you get into a certain place in your church and things aren't working like you think they're supposed to work and you start thinking, well, maybe I'm not, maybe I'm not doing exactly what God thinks I should do. Maybe, maybe I'm on the wrong path. Maybe I'm a failure. I missed my call. Maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. If he had been saying those things, that would have been counterfeit. That was not the truth. The truth was, is where he was, is where he was supposed to be. We had a very great philosopher in the 20th century. Sometimes he's a little bit underrated because of his horrible singing voice that everybody seems to love. Bob Dylan, y'all remember him? Some of you that are, you know, you baby boomers, y'all know Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan had a song. His song said this, you may be an ambassador to England or France. You may like to gamble. You may like to dance. You might be the heavyweight champion. I'm telling you, Logan, you cannot do this without wanting to sing this song. You may, not, you may be the heavyweight champion of the world or you may be a socialite with a long string of pearls, but you're going to have to serve somebody, right? Yes, indeed, he says, you're going to serve somebody. What's the next line? Well, it might be the devil or it might be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. Body. Now listen, that song's not just for old folks. Did y'all know that it was on The Sopranos? Sopranos wasn't that long ago. And do you know that in 2017 they had a Showtime series and it was in the Showtime series too? Not that bad, huh? And the point of that is you're going to serve somebody. You're going to serve somebody. No, wait a minute, Randy. Paul's in bondage. He's serving bondage. Aren't those two different things? Au contraire, mon frere. Those are not two different things. Let's talk about it. Remember the first line of Philippians? Paul says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. Now, servant sounds kind of neat, right? I mean, I'd like to have a servant. Guys, we think we've got one. We call it a wife, but that will get us in big trouble. I'm telling you right now. I'd like to have a servant. Somebody gets your clothes ready, got everything ironed for you, you know, gets the food you want, cooks it just like you want it, get your car washed, get your car vacuumed. They do all the, you know, stuff around the house. They wear nifty little uniforms. We think about servants being over in Buckingham Palace and you've got all the female servants wearing their little maid outfits and you've got all of the male servants in their little butler garb and they probably get paid pretty well and they probably quit if they want to. That's not a servant that we're talking about here. See, the word that Paul uses here is a, is a Greek word that many of you have heard before, which is the word doulos, which means slave. And see, slave is not as clean as servant. 
slave, we, we have images in our mind when we talk about slavery, right? So let's, let's listen to the definition of the word slavery. We know what it means, but I just, y'all humor me. I looked it up, and this is the definition of the word slavery. The, it, it says, a slave is a person who is the legal property of another. Some of you will remember the verse that says, you were bought with a price. You were bought with a price. All right? So, so you, you are the property of another and is forced to obey them. Now, that sort of bothers me. I don't like to be forced to do anything. But if that is correct, then Paul's imprisonment is just where Jesus wants him to be. Right? Since God is sovereign, then God wants Paul in a position where he is in jail, in bondage, cannot do what he wants to do. He is not physically free. And Paul looks at that and he says, that's real. That's what God wants for me. To Paul be, to, for Paul to be sitting in prison saying that this isn't where I'm supposed to be, that I was meant for better than this, that I'm supposed to be doing something else, that's counterfeit. Because see, where God has you is where you belong. Where God has you in that moment is where you belong. That's what he sees is real. For Paul to be sitting in prison and saying anything else would be counterfeit. He's a slave of Jesus. He found himself in prison, so instead of bemoaning his circumstances, he kept talking about Jesus until everybody knew that the reason that Paul is, pre is in jail is because he's preaching, and they either believed him or they didn't, and that's okay. He didn't care which one it was. He just knew that he was going to tell everybody that I've got a message that can change your life if you will allow it to, if you will receive what I'm telling you. Now, where have you been? And what have you done? What place do you find yourself in that you don't want to be there? There was a greater philosopher than Bob Dylan. He lived back in the first century and he said this, Truly I tell you, everyone who commits a sin is a slave of sin. Well, now who's committed a sin? Paul comes back later in the book of Romans and he says, For all have sinned. Every last stinking one of us. So Bob Dylan has it right. You're going to serve somebody. It might be the devil or it might be the Lord, but you're going to serve somebody. And who we serve makes a difference to how we live when our life gets shaken. When our life gets shaken. Because you know, when you're facing a divorce, or you're in a hard situation at work. Things aren't like you want them to be at school. They're not like you want them to be at church. They're not somewhere else. You thought you'd be somewhere else, but here you are. You are shaken. This isn't the way I thought it was going to be. When you are shaken, what is in you is what comes out of you. Logan told us a story this week about what happened while he and Becca were at Union, uh, Union University in Jackson, Tennessee, doing their undergraduate work. A good friend of theirs was tragically killed, and it devastated, it devastated all of her friends. When a young person dies, that's tragic enough. I can guarantee when a young person dies, it's going to be a giant funeral because it's, young people aren't supposed to die. It's going to be a giant funeral. In this situation, I believe the young lady was murdered, so it made it even worse. Everybody mourning for her, so they have a service, and a professor stands up, and he brings a water bottle. And he opens the lid of the water bottle. And then he shakes the bottle. And water comes out of the top of it, sloshing all over everything. And he says... When you're shaken, what is in you splashes out. When Paul was shaken, Jesus splashed on everybody. He splashed on everybody. Now, maybe you're not a Christ follower. You hadn't trusted Jesus as your Savior. You're not really sure about all this stuff. Scripture says, if you believe it, you don't have to, but I do. Scripture says that you're a slave to sin. 
you're going to serve somebody, Bob Dylan. If you're not going to believe the scripture, believe Bob Dylan. You know, you're going to serve somebody. So if you're not serving Jesus, you're serving somebody else. You belong to somebody else. Well, that sounds pretty churchy, but really think about this. When you're in a bad situation, a hard situation, a situation that you didn't plan to be in, when you are shaken, what comes out of you? If your desire is all money, that's what you think is going to fix everything. When you're shaken, you're going to put money towards it. You're going to try to fix it with money. You're going to try to buy your way out of it. Some women do something called, this gets me in trouble, some women do something called retail therapy. Now, that's not necessarily wrong unless every time something goes wrong in your life, you've got to go buy something. Because that makes me feel better. It fixes my problem. Men do the same thing. You go into somebody's house and they've got more guns than you could kill an army with. They've got more boats. They've got four-wheelers. They've got all this stuff. And you, and you wonder sometimes, why are you accumulating? I know you hunt. You do. You do. I got all that. But sometimes you just keep accumulating, accumulating, accumulating because you're shaken. And when you're shaken, you've got to, whatever's in you, it's got to come out. And, you know, you can do the traditional stuff. You can do the sex. You can do drugs. You can do, you can do alcohol. If those are your things, when you're shaking, you reach for those things. If your job is your thing, then that's what you put more time into. You put more effort into it to try to make it a little bit better. If you are shaken, what sloshes out of you? If Jesus isn't in you, Jesus will never slosh out. If you're not a Christ follower, well, maybe that's okay with you. But now let me ask you this question that, that's, that's a little more intense to me anyway, is that you know you're going to get into a bad situation. When you're into that bad situation in your life, are you glad you're in it? How do you react when you get into that bad situation? Paul says, I rejoice. He says, I rejoice. I'm glad that Jesus put me in this situation because no matter what happens, even if I'm in prison, it's all good. Jesus, the main thing of my life is being done. I'm good with this. It's okay. It's in his hands. Do you ever wake up in the morning? The answer is no. If you tell me any other, any other answer, I will believe that you'll be lying to me and you will have to explain yourself and maybe you can convince me. But do you ever wake up in the morning knowing you're going to have a horrible day, that it's going to be a bad meeting, that you're going to a job you don't like with people that you don't like in a place that you don't like, you're going to school to people that you don't care for, you've got a test coming up that day that's not properly studied for, you've got all the things that are going on and you wake up in the morning and go, praise Jesus, it's going to be a horrible day. I don't think anybody does that. I know I don't do that. Yet Paul wakes up in the morning going, this prison that I'm in, it's okay because God put me here. And while I'm shaken, I'm going to splash Jesus all over everybody. So you're not a Christian. You say to me, well, Pastor Randy, I know a lot of Christians who don't slosh so well. <laughs> don't you know? How many of you in here, this is just out of my curiosity as a comparison to earlier service. How many of you in here were not born in 1980? Not just that year, but since 1980. You weren't born before 1980. So you were born after 1980. Could you raise your hand? Born after 1980? after 19 yeah there you go you really you're a baby I didn't know that how about that cool okay 1980 I was born in fact 1980 I was working for IBM at IBM's regional administrative support center in Colony Square at the corner of either 10th and Peachtree or 14th and Peachtree I can't remember exactly where I had a fancy title. I was a senior administrative specialist, which is a fancy name for a billing and inventory control clerk. I was about three steps above an entry-level job. I was not management. I was nobody. I was a clerk. But let me tell you something. I was a good clerk. I wasn't just a good clerk. I was a great clerk. I wasn't just a great clerk. I was the best clerk. I am not kidding you. That is not brag. I could pull out the papers and show you. When I was in that job, they gave me the Atlanta office. The Atlanta office was the biggest office that you could have. We, we did Florida, 
Tennessee, let's see, we did Florida, Tennessee, North and South Carolina, and Georgia. And the biggest office to support was the Atlanta office, and they gave me the Atlanta office. When I got it, it was woefully behind. I mean, it was so far behind, but I am the kind of guy that I want to do the best work all the time, everywhere. You may not think it here, but I am doing my best. I do the best work that I possibly can. My goal is excellence, and I worked as hard as I could, and I got that office closed caught up and not only did I get that office caught up but while I was doing my thing I discovered that we were losing revenue under certain situations and there was a computer which back in 1980 we didn't have personal computers like big computers and we had a system in the sky and I found out that the system was tracking this stuff and nobody knew it and so I came up with this process that we could do this and they said well Randy you can't really do that because you're not authorized blah 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 so I go to the right people and do the right things and I work and I work and I work and they make me write a manual and I write a manual and they read the manual and they say it's approved and they published it to be used all across the United States I am not kidding you my work was published for every regional administrative support system and system for small business and IBM all across the United States. I was the man. I'm telling you I was the man. And see, if you've ever worked for a major corporation, there's a point. I'm not just bragging. This is fact. I was the, if you ever work for a major corporation, you understand that they have things that they send their top performers to every year. You know? At, at AT&T, it was Circle of Excellence, top 2%. At Bell South, it was the Pinnacle Club, top 2%. IBM had the Diamond Club. They had a trip. Administrative person gets to go. And my trip. And my trip. I am the best in here, and you all know it. So when it's time to announce that trip, I'm going to go. I'm going to get my Diamond Club trip. And I went into that meeting, and I was all humble and everything, you know. Walked in, sit down, and people would say, you know, this is going to be, no, nah, not mine, man. You know, it's not just, you know, it's just normal stuff, all this. And I was all this, and we had the meeting, and they announced the name, and it wasn't me. You know what's even worse? It was the worst performer in the group. must have seen it on my face because my boss pulled me aside later and he said to me listen I want you to understand that she was the most improved person we the the award wasn't for the most improved it was for the best I was the best she could improve but she had a long way to go she improved more than anybody else and we thought God only knows who we were we thought that if we gave her the award, it would encourage her to continue growing. And I, I understand. In fact, it's probably the right decision. Yes, I'm sure. I am very proud for her. Let me tell you something. There was no Jesus sloshing out of this boy that day. In fact, there was no Jesus sloshing out of this boy for a little while. I went to a funk. I didn't want to go to work anymore. Work was what filled me. I didn't want to work for these stupid people going to work my rear end off for them and they're not going to give me what I deserve for this? Huh. No. Christians live their life and sometimes Jesus doesn't slosh out. But what I wasn't mature enough to understand then, I have grown in maturity maturity to understand. My love has been filled with knowledge and discernment so that I understand now that God had me right where he wanted me to be because he was going to continue working on me until I could be the pastor of the First Baptist Church of Gray. It's part of my training. See, God knew what he was doing. My loved ones at Spart enough wasn't discerning enough to be able to separate what was real from what was counterfeit. You're a slave. All of us are. What are you a slave to? And when you, are, when you are shaken, what sloshes out of you? 
Paul's shaking was vicious. When you read the story and listen to it, these people, while he was in prison, bound in chains and bondage, unable to go to the bathroom without asking somebody for permission, unable to stop anybody from saying anything about him, there were other people that were thrilled to death that Paul's out of commission. They're going around telling folks, you know what, and you've probably had this happen to you. If they're such a good person, if Paul was such a good person, then why did God let him go to prison? Why was he in prison? If he was so great, if he was such a great preacher, why has God done this bad thing to him? And we've probably said that same thing to to ourselves about other people. If they're so great, why is this happening? Well, I wonder, could it be? I wonder, could it be that God has them exactly where he wants them to be so that they could end up sloshing Jesus on everybody to the glory of God the Father? Paul could have let their freedom eat eat him alive He could have gotten wrapped up in envy. Their taunts could have sent him into a raging, fuming tirade. He could have let their envy and rivalry of him sink him into the deepest funk imaginable. And instead, Paul says, it's okay. I'm glad. I'm glad because what I stand for is happening. The gospel is being shared. When the ministry team was talking about this text, uh, a couple of weeks ago, Michael Abney said to me, he said, no, Randy, you need to remember something, though. When you're talking about millennials, folks between the ages of 23 and 38, Jesus typically isn't in their top five. I'm not really worried about Jesus slosh now. Jesus isn't in the top five. And I got to thinking about that age group, and I know it's been a long, long time, but I can look at pictures and it helps me remember. And see, back in those days, between the ages of 18 and 35, that's typically when you get married for the first time. Now, you hope it's the last time, the only time, but sometimes it's not. But during those ages, you usually get married for the first time. And so when you get married, your spouse is in your top five. I mean, they're just in your top five. And then while, while in that age group, typically we, we start, um, start getting our careers in order. And our careers in our top five, we want to be somebody, we want to do something, we want to make our mark, we want to make our name. So career is very important, it's in our top five. And then as time passes and things go on, we start to have children or we adopt, you know, 18 to 35. You'll have one child, then there'll be a second, a third. Once you get to four, you've sort of lost your mind, but there are people that go four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, whatever number. We get some big numbers out there, but you start having all these kids and they start hitting in the top five. And then you're you're starting to establish your home and you've got your house and you're starting to establish your independence from your mom and dad and you're building a new life and there's a whole lot of stuff to fill up your top five in life there really is and and Paul's prayer was that our love would be smart enough and discerning enough to know what was real for God and what was counterfeit. And all these things that I talked about, they're insanely important, but when the shaking comes and the shaking is going to come, what is going to shake out of you? And what needs to shake out of you is Jesus because he's the one that will see you through every bit of that. Spouses drive you crazy. Children drive you crazy. The stuff you own, you don't own your stuff. Your stuff owns you. I'm sitting here right now thinking of of the house and all the little projects that need to be done. You've got to do them. You've got a car. It's got to be maintained. You've got all this stuff that... When all of this shaking occurs in your life, what's going to slosh out of you? Paul is saying, Jesus is what it is. Paul's in prison, but he knows he's free. He doesn't care what anybody says about him. It doesn't matter. All he knows is that because he continues to do what God's called him to do, even in the place that he is in, the work's being done. He doesn't envy those who aren't in prison he he doesn't hate those who are putting him down he's not angry with God his fist in the air pumping like Job did saying why is this bad thing happening to me 
He's not depressed. He's not dejected. He doesn't quit. Paul knows what is real, and what is real is Jesus in my life. There is nothing better. There is nothing more. Jesus in my life. Do you understand what Jesus has done for you? You were a sinner destined to go to hell when you die. You were a sinner destined to live your entire life making up your own rules, doing the best you can in every situation. You were living under the wrath of God. He was angry. He was angry at the sin that inhabited everything we did. And he was perfectly just in saying that I will have nothing to do with you for all eternity. But he loved us so much that in while we were yet sinners, when we didn't know what we needed, we had no clue what it was that we were to do or that we even needed rescuing. While we were sinners, he died for us so that we could be free and we could live our lives to the glory of God the Father. The very blood of the Son of God was poured out to pay the price for our sins. If he did that, will he leave us alone in the middle of our shaking? If he did that, would he allow us to go any place that he would not go? I must not be in God's will. How can I be away from God? Scripture says that nothing can separate me. Nothing. So if I am going through hell and torment in my life, am I to believe that he is not here with me? No, he is here with me. And not only is he with me, he, is, he has me here for a purpose. And if I, will, if I will trust his purpose, he will give glory to God the Father because of what he has done in me. It's a whole lot better than getting the diamond club at IBM. The Father smiles. When you are shaken, what comes out of you? Let's pray. Father, I pray uh, that, that the story of Lydia being called gives me such comfort because I know that you opened her heart. Paul could have preached a million sermons and had, not, had you not opened her eyes to the fact that she needed a rescuer. Lydia would be just as lost as she ever was and at this point would be in her eternity separated from you forever. But you and your divine mercy opened her heart to hear that there was a Savior that was sent to rescue us. That even while we didn't know we needed a rescuer, you were already calling 911, getting the rescuer to come to save us and to take us home. I pray that you open our hearts, Lord, to that. And Lord, those of us who are Christian who are thinking, well, I've heard that a million times. Why am I hearing it again? Father, open our hearts to understand what gratitude needs to fill our heart because of the tragedy that was coming that you saved us from. And the fact, Father, that when we are shaken, you were in the midst of that. Please, Father, make us strong, make us strong, make us strong in the knowledge of the love of Christ. Make us strong in the knowledge that God sent his son. Make us strong in the knowledge that the Holy Spirit inhabits us and holds us fast in every situation that we find ourselves in that you have put us in in every situation. Help us, Father, we pray. Help us to see and to hear and to know. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you this morning to come to the rescuer.
We are, we, we are, we were sinners. Oh, we've used the word so many times, it's almost meaningless. But we've all done, we've all been apart from God. And he doesn't want that, he wants us with him. So he sent his son Jesus to save us, to bring us home. And he says that what you have to do is receive that. You can't be good enough. You can't clean yourself up well enough. You can't do any of that. You didn't even know you needed him. And he was already ready to save you. I ask you this morning that if you've never trusted Christ as your savior, you've never trusted him as your rescuer, that you do that this morning. It will change your life. You can come down the aisle and tell me about it. You can come up after the service is over and tell me. It doesn't matter. If you want to join the church, you can come down. You can come after the service and tell me. Whatever. Pray in your seat. Pray at the altar. Christians, think about what has been done for you when you didn't even know you needed it. Thank the Lord for it. Let's stand together.